Brethren, the story of a great recovery. Part 1 England and Wales. Chapter 28. Kingston on Thames, 1867. In the recording of events which have, in divinely ordered sequence, led up to the formation of an assembly of believers, one is apt to overlook the labors of the faithful few behind the scenes, those whose names are known only to the one they seek to magnify, those whose unfailing constancy in spiritual affairs escape the attention of the public eye and, anon, pass by unseen and unsung. And yet not unseen by him whose record, unspoilt by the fickle pen of human efflorescence, will be revealed in the light of a day yet to come. While the names and doings of men of succeeding generations take preeminence in the building up of the church, the honored place of the woman, alone with God in the secret of her chamber, can never be fully estimated. It is said that the prevailing prayer of two Christian sisters, unknown to the subject of their supplications, contributed in no small measure to the coming of Dwight L. Moody to Great Britain in the early seventies. In like manner it was the fervent prayer of a saintly woman in Surbiton that brought about the establishment of an assembly in the town of Kingston-on-Thames. For some time Miss Ranyards had been much concerned about the need of the gospel in that town. Towards the end of 1865 she wrote to the Open Air Mission, London, to send someone to Kingston Fair. In response to the appeal two or three young men attended the fair, where an opportunity was afforded for carrying the gospel to the crowds who had come to town for the festival. Oliver Fry, one of the young preachers, was invited to remain at Kingston that he might follow up the work, and the next day was spent visiting the cottagers in their homes. This resulted in a gospel meeting being arranged for in one of the cottages. So keen was the interest that some who were unable to gain access refused to go home and remain standing outside the open door. The gospel message, presented in all its sweetness and simplicity by the young preacher, carried conviction to one who was leaning against the wall by the door listening. This was the beginning of a remarkable work of grace, and soon afterwards a large room was hired in the building opposite to where the old gospel hall was later erected. Here meetings were continued till 1867. About this time a number of those recently saved, as well as others who had come to know the will of the Lord, walked to Hampton Court Assembly each Lord's Day for the purpose of remembering the Lord in the breaking of bread. The distance, however, rendered it rather inconvenient for some who desired to attend, and it was decided to seek guidance that the way might be made clear for commencing an assembly at Kingston. Soon afterwards a suitable room was acquired in Fairfield Place. There being no accommodation in the House of Baptistry was dug in the garden, the first to carry out the scriptural command being those brethren who had so recently come to a knowledge of the truth. Before the close of the same year in which the little company began to break bread, the room and passage leading to it were on many occasions crowded during the gospel meeting, and it became necessary to remove to larger premises, which were obtained in the Assize Court buildings. The old gospel hall was then planned, and in 1868 was opened for use. During this time Oliver Fry, who had been prevailed upon to take up residence at Kingston, continued to shepherd the flock, besides giving much of his time to gospel work in the neighborhood. The testimony begun at the fair was continued each year with evidence of blessing, and in 1868 a booth was built where gospel services were held nightly. Whilst in the midst of active work for the master, and when his influence for God in the town was acknowledged by all who knew him, Mr. Fry was suddenly called away from the scene of his labors and from those who loved him. On the 16th of July 1869, while bathing in the river, he was drowned. This seemed an irreparable loss, but through the mercy of God those left behind were kept together. Mr. Grove, a brother who came to reside in the town about the same time as Mr. Fry, then saw it was the Lord's will that he should give more of his time to the work of the young assembly. For a number of years he was, with the help of others, used in piloting the assembly through years of difficulty and disappointment, cheered only by seasons of spiritual blessing, at a time when the tactful exercise of a gracious spirit was required in warding off the assiduous attentions of the enemy of the church. The history of this assembly is one of varied experience. Still, those who continued steadfast ever sought by God's help to keep the light burning. This they did in face of many difficulties, for the assembly was called upon to pass through yet another time of testing when, on the 9th of February 1917, the gospel hall was burned down. From that time the assembly met in hired premises, till in 1926, having purchased a plot of land in Canbury Park Road, the present hall was built and opened in that same year. Since then many have been added to the church, the number now in fellowship being about a hundred and fifty. 
The Testimony at Baldock Allusion has already been made to the useful part played by a tent mission in connection with the formation of an assembly. Particularly is this the case in outlying districts cut off from the main arteries and in a considerable measure away from the beaten track. About the year 1879, John Brunton, an evangelist, took his tent to Baldock in Hertfordshire and preached what many thought to be a new type of doctrine. Up to that time no definite evangelistic work had been known in that district, and the advent of a tent pitched in the corner of a field drew many to hear this itinerant preacher. What they did hear was not the stereotyped kind of sermon to which they had been accustomed during their attendance at the parish church nearby, but an ungarnished elucidation of the Holy Scriptures delivered to them in such a way that set the village talking. This kind of preaching was quite new to those who attended the tent services, and while some scoffed at the presumption of this unordained preacher, it was evident that there were those who had come with a sincere desire to learn more concerning the Scriptures. Mr. Brunton, therefore, asked them to bring their Bibles. And so from the infallible word of truth he was able not only to point anxious ones to the Savior, but it came about that before the mission ended a little company drawn from church and chapel, enlightened by a fresh revelation of what to them was entirely new, came together simply as Christians to remember the Lord in the breaking of bread. For some time they met in a hired room, but two of their number being engaged in the building trade a suitable piece of ground was secured upon which an iron room, large enough to seat a hundred persons, was erected. Henry Groves followed John Brunton, and his visit to Baldock, which was chiefly with a view to ministering to the spiritual needs of the young assembly, resulted in many more being added to the church. Since then the assembly has continued faithful to the word, through difficult times and in face of much opposition, and though their name, like that of numerous other such isolated gatherings of the Lord's people throughout the country, may take but a humble place, yet their testimony to the truth and power of the gospel will not pass unrewarded by their Lord. In South Devon while the tented Baldock was fulfilling its mission in the gathering in of souls for the kingdom, a similar work was making itself felt in the South Devon village of Starcross. John Harris, the gardener to a local clergyman, in company with Frank Tupman, a fellow Christian, hired an unoccupied cottage, which was let to them at a nominal rent, and commenced gospel meetings. Previous to this, the only religious evidence in the village was the parish church, whose interest in the spiritual welfare of the inhabitants appeared to extend little beyond the formalities of the Lord's Day services. Fifty-odd years ago, the time of which we white this neighborhood, I understand, was notable for its lawlessness and utter disregard for God and of any form of religious worship. The novelty, therefore, of a cottage meeting conducted by two young men aroused curiosity and the room was filled nightly. Thus the Lord gave token of His approval at the commencement by saving souls. About this time, two evangelists, panting in Honeywell by name, arrived in the neighborhood with a large tent which they pitched on a vacant patch of ground. No previous arrangement having been made, their arrival was taken as an answer to prayer. Gospel meetings were continued for several weeks with a manifestation of real interest and blessing, so that before the mission ended a little company of believers came together under the canvas of the tent in apostolic simplicity to remember the Lord's death. Soon afterwards a portable iron building was erected on the same piece of ground where the tent had stood. Thus the efforts begun in the cottage, and strengthened by the coming of the tent, resulted in the formation of the Starcross Assembly. Twenty years later a brick building replaced the iron structure, which had now become too small. Owing to local prejudice some difficulty was experienced in securing ground for the erection of the new hall, but the Lord inclined the heart of a brewer, who offered a piece of land which formed part of a publican's garden, and a building capable of accommodating about 200 people was erected on this site. 